so delighted to be with you today, and oh, that worship. <laughs> One of my favorite things about the lectures is the chance for all of us who are from so many different places and backgrounds to worship our great God together. So I'm so grateful to United Voice for leading us with their gifts and their joy this morning. Thank you. As Mike mentioned earlier, I have the tremendous privilege of being a professor of New Testament here at Pepperdine, and I love my job so much because I get to work with and walk alongside so many wonderful students, and many of them just left seven days ago. But I was looking back at my week, and I feel like a lot has happened since they left. Uh, all of you have arrived to join us, of course, and on Tuesday, I was happy to welcome to campus my wonderful parents who are here this morning. Um, attending, I think, maybe their 30th or 31st lecture. And yesterday I said goodbye at the airport to my daughter, who was on her way to Amman, Jordan, to spend a month with 14 other Pepperdine students and a professor studying Middle Eastern history and culture. And as we prayed with this group at the airport, I thought to myself how much I appreciate what Pepperdine is doing here in the lectures and the lives of our students, and I appreciate this not only as a faculty member, but as a parent, too. You may have heard, I think you probably have, that Pepperdine was trending in the news cycle this week, <laughs> thanks to the antics of two pelicans that chose to photobomb our Seaver College graduation. And I happen to have a front row seat for this show, and it really was pretty amazing. I don't know if you've ever been to a zoo or a wild animal park where they have those bird shows and they ask someone to hold up a dollar, you know, and the hawk or the parrot sweeps down right across the heads of the people. That's what the pelicans did. Um, they skimmed right across the crowd a couple of times and then for whatever reason they decided to land right in the middle of the crowd and then they were ushered away, I kid you not, by security folks wearing black suits and ear sets. <laughs> And one of them kept coming back, one of the uh, pe not, pe pelicans, <laughs> and landing over and over again on a woman's sun umbrella and then settled down on the bleachers until finally a man walked up, scooped up the bird under his arm and gently held its beak and walked out with it. And I remember seeing this and thinking, who does this? <laughs> And then President Benton shared with us on opening night on Tuesday that there just happened to be a swan farmer in the audience. Uh, because, of course, there was. <laughs> you couldn't make this stuff up, but I really enjoy watching pelicans when they're out on the water. I don't know if you've seen this, they're majestic when they fly, and if you're like me, you might love watching them fly high up in the air and then dive down to catch a fish. And they're also fun to watch because they kind of surf the waves by catching the updraft as the waves break. But when you're dressed up sitting in a crowd watching your child graduate and a 40-pound bird with a nine-foot wingspan lands on your head, <laughs> that's another story altogether. <laughs> that is what we call a surprise. And I bring this up because our text today in, of the Holy Spirit from Luke, comes from the Gospel of Luke. And in Luke and Acts, the Holy Spirit has a tendency to surprise the people in the story. And two of these surprises are in the passage that we'll be looking at today in Luke 4. The scene is Jesus' first public preaching, and he says surprising things about himself and the Holy Spirit. Now, if we think about surprises, we know that some surprises are welcome. They're good news. If a friend surprises us with a present or a special lunch, we tend to react well. But other times, surprises shock or challenge us, kind of like a pelican landing on our heads. <laughs> it isn't exactly bad or tragic, but it does catch us off guard. Surprises can startle us. Surprises can challenge our cherished notions, and we never know how we're going to respond in those moments. Sometimes our better selves rise up, but other times we can get kind of ugly. On occasion, I have reacted to something I did not expect in a way I later regretted. <laughs> Maybe you know what I mean. <laughs> As we look together at Luke 4 this morning, we are going to find both kinds of surprises. Surprising good news, which everyone loves, followed by a surprising challenge, which does not go well. But before we dig into the story, let's spend a minute thinking about how Luke gets us to chapter 4. The Holy Spirit empowers John the Baptist even before he is born. 
The Holy Spirit overshadows Mary bringing about the birth of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit inspires people in the story to interpret what's happening in Jesus' birth. And it's clear that what's happening is the arrival in Jesus through the Holy Spirit of dramatic help from God. Not an everyday sort of help, but exactly the particular reality-changing divine help that the people of Israel have long awaited, and Luke calls this arrival of God's help salvation. The Holy Spirit then fills Jesus at his baptism, leads Jesus immediately out into the desert where he's tempted, and when Jesus returns back home to the region of Galilee where he grew up, Luke tells us that Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit, and he goes around to various villages teaching, and people start talking. Reports start to spread about him, and everyone sings his praises. I guess you could say he starts to go viral. No other gospel starts with this intense emphasis on the power and work of the Holy Spirit to bring about the long-awaited salvation of God through Jesus. This is Luke's distinctive way of telling us Jesus' story. And that brings us to Luke 4.16. When we get there, we know that God's salvation is arriving through Jesus, who is filled with the Spirit, and now we get to find out what this salvation looks like. At Luke 4.16, Jesus finally returns to his hometown, Nazareth, the place where he was raised. Word has been circulating about him. He's coming home, I think, some, uh, as something of a local celebrity. And on Sabbath, he goes to the synagogue and participates in the reading and exposition of scripture. Jesus finds a spot in the scroll to read. It might have been a pre-selected spot. It might have been something he chose. We aren't sure. But in any case, he locates these words from Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Luke shifts into slow motion. We see Jesus carefully roll up the scroll, return it to the attendant, and sit down. It's like Luke is signaling to us as the audience to pay attention to this moment. It's important. And in case we miss this clue, Luke then tells us in verse 20 that the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on Jesus. The word fixed translates one of Luke's favorite words in Greek to describe when someone is really looking intently at someone else. So everyone, both those of us who are reading and those who are in the synagogue alike are focused with rapt attention and expectation on what Jesus, the semi-famous local boy who has now come home, will say next. And Jesus says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is big, surprising news. Isaiah's words Hearken back to an ideal from the book of Leviticus called the year of Jubilee. Once every 50 years there was to be a year in Israel when liberty was proclaimed. It was a time of restoration to family lands, release from slavery, canceling of debts. This time of release had everything to do with the fact that God was king over Israel. God is a God who sets people free from slavery and oppression, and we know this because of the Exodus, when God heard and answered the cries of the Hebrews and set them free. And so the people of God were called to practice the same kind of liberation. Their economic and social life in the land needed to reflect the freedom-making God who reigned over them. So Isaiah is reaching back to the idea of Jubilee to describe a time of renewal in his future, not a literal year, but a period, a time of what we might call the Holy Spirit's Jubilee. And Isaiah's description expands this future Jubilee far beyond the original. It will be a time of good news for all those who are poor, captive, blind, and oppressed, Good news that the Holy Spirit is bringing release, recovery, and freedom. Good news about the reign of God and the salvation that it brings. And Jesus says, it is happening now. 
This must be a surprise to the people in the audience, but this is the good kind of surprise. And they respond well, they love it, everyone speaks well of him, they are amazed at the gracious words coming from his mouth. They are excited. And we should be excited too. Because this passage paints a picture of what our salvation is all about. Good news, recovery, release, and freedom for the poor, captive, blind, and oppressed. And these are just examples of the jubilee of the Holy Spirit that reaches into all aspects of human life. Freedom from economic oppression, political oppression, the oppression of illnesses and other bodily challenges, the oppression of addictions, the oppression of evil, sin, and death, it is really good news. But I have seen two ways that Christians sometimes back away from the amazing promise of these words. First, sometimes we narrow the good news of salvation so that we end up thinking that it's mostly about the afterlife. By thinking this way, we're missing out on how much the Holy Spirit desires to set us free now. In an adult Sunday school class many years ago, I heard one of the class members describe our Christian lives in a way that really struck, stuck with me. He said, our lives as Christians are like being on an airplane in a holding pattern. We just need to circle in the air, waiting to get to our destination. But that image doesn't seem to me to fit with the Holy Spirit's jubilee that we see here in Luke. Jesus says that the Spirit is setting people free now. It's powerful, it's real, and it's making a difference in our world. We are not on a holding pattern. And a second way that we sometimes back away from the promise and the power of these words is that we over-spiritualize this passage. We see it as speaking about our souls only. We see it as release from sin or the consequences of sin, but in a very limited way. And while it's clear in scripture that the good news sets us free from sin and death, it's also clear that God cares about us as whole people. A philosopher named, named J. K., James K. A. Smith likes to say that we humans are not just brains on a stick. <laughs> We're whole beings. And I think sometimes Christians have a tendency to think of ourselves as souls on a stick, that God wants to save our souls. But the biblical picture is that God created us and redeems us and sets us free as whole people. Amen. With bodies and minds and souls, we are a package deal. And so what I love about the picture of the Holy Spirit's jubilee in Luke 4 is how clear it is that God cares about all the very real kinds of oppression and enslavement that people face in all areas of our human lives. God cares about challenges and illnesses our bodies face. God cares about our economic well-being, and I don't mean success and wealth, but our ability to feed and clothe and house and care for ourselves and our families. God cares about the injustices that we suffer, both large and small. God cares about those of us who have been abused, mistreated, harassed, marginalized, or minoritized by systems or people in power, whether that power is spiritual, political, economic, or social. God cares. And the Holy Spirit is about the business of setting us free. Of course, we see Jesus, who is filled with the Holy Spirit, do these very things, right? He brings sight to the blind, he restores the hearing of the deaf, he heals bodies, he releases people from the oppression of evil spirits, he eats with sinners and tax collectors, he touches lepers. But the Holy Spirit's jubilee does not end with Jesus' earthly life, it continues through his followers. We see this happen in Acts. When the Holy Spirit falls upon 120 men and women in an upper room in Jerusalem, what do they do? They go out and they preach about release from sin. They heal a lame man so that he leaps joyfully and praises God at the temple gates. They gather together and they share all things in common so that the poor have no need. In other words, empowered by the Spirit, they cooperate in the Spirit's work of release, releasing people, whole people, from spiritual, bodily, and economic oppression, and this is great news. But here it's important to acknowledge something. The Holy Spirit's jubilee is unlimited, but we humans experience that salvation in a limited way. 
I don't need to tell you that even when we pray fervently and with faith, God does not always heal. Even when we cry out to God for release from some kind of oppression, we find ourselves waiting for that freedom to come. And I don't think it's right to say that if we just had more faith, God would make it happen. After all, if you think about it, Peter and Paul had great faith. Peter was set free from prison in Jerusalem. Paul slipped away from arrest in Damascus. Paul providentially survived beatings and shipwrecks and was released from prison in Philippi. God's release, the Holy Spirit's release, flowed down on them in great waves until the day that it didn't. As far as we know, one day they weren't set free from prison, but taken by soldiers from their cells and executed. And was this because they didn't have enough faith or didn't pray hard enough? I don't think so. So Jesus' announcement of liberation in Luke 4 is not a simplistic formula. If you just have enough faith or you're just open enough to the Holy Spirit, you will be successful and healthy. No. We experience the release of the Holy Spirit's jubilee in the midst of a tension between what has been called the now and the not yet. It is here now. The power of the resurrection has broken into our world now, but we still live in a world of gravity and inertia and disease and human error and human sin. God, through Jesus, has vanquished evil and death. But temporally, they still have a foothold in our world. So we won't experience the full effect of this liberation until our Lord returns. But even as we acknowledge this tension, we also know that the Holy Spirit's power and desire to set us free is deep, active, and real. It's changing us, and it's changing our world. And I can think of so many ways that the Holy Spirit has set me free. I'll mention just one. When I was younger, I suffered from terrible social anxiety. I had a hard time speaking in front of more than a few people, even in casual conversation. And it did feel like a prison. And the fact that I am speaking to you today is part of my own personal testimony to the powerful, liberating work of the Spirit. And if we stop to think about it, I hope that all of us have similar testimonies about how the Holy Spirit has set us free from the prisons in our lives. And today we also cooperate with the Holy Spirit's work of setting people free. When we walk alongside a friend struggling with sin, when we pray with and for that person, when our words bring God's grace and release from shame, we are joining in the jubilee work of the Holy Spirit. Some of us here today or listening at home may be doctors or nurses or psychologists, therapists, other healthcare professionals. When you help people find release from the oppression of illnesses of all sorts, you are part of the Holy Spirit's jubilee. When we support those who seek freedom from addictions, we are joining in the work of the Holy Spirit's jubilee. When we pray about and work to change our ways of thinking and acting in order to set our world free from the prisons of systemic racism or misogyny or other ways that we humans oppress each other, we are part of the Holy Spirit's jubilee. The Holy Spirit is bringing renewal, and this renewal takes root in our human actions and choices. It is such needed and good news in our world. And I would really just like to linger with you in the good news this morning. But I can't because the story doesn't end there. It goes on and tells us about a second surprise from Jesus, one that challenges the people and one that goes quite badly. In fact, in just six verses, the people's response to Jesus goes from a lot of likes on his social media page to some very intense trolling. <laughs> um, or to be precise and more serious, they go from all speaking well of Jesus to trying to throw him off of a cliff. What in the world did Jesus say in those six verses to make them so mad? Let's pick up the story where we left off. Everyone speaks well of Jesus. They are amazed at the gracious words coming from his mouth, and they are proud of their hometown boy. They look around and say to each other, this is Joseph's son. 
This man with these gracious words announcing the arrival of divine salvation and talking about the year of the Lord's favor and talking about spirit-empowered salvation and saying it's here now. This is Joseph's son. He's from our little town. Now I should point out that some readers of Luke see this line about Joseph's son not as hometown pride but as criticism. They see the folks in Nazareth saying something like, well, he sounds impressive and confident, but we know who he really is. (laughs) He's not a learned man. He's just Joseph's son. It's certainly possible to read this line this way, but I think it makes more sense to see the people emphasizing their affinity and their kinship with Jesus. Wow, he's really making a splash. He's bringing good things, and he's our guy. This option makes a lot of sense to me because right after they say this, Jesus says, doubtless. You will quote to me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself, and you will say, do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. In other words, Jesus is saying to them, when you talk to me about being Joseph's son, I know what you really mean. You really mean that we expect you as the local guy to bring release for us. The year of the Lord's favor for us. Good news, release, recovery, freedom for us. Holy Spirit, empowered salvation for us. But Jesus replies, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. It seems to me that Jesus is questioning their local pride perspective by reminding them that true prophets challenge their hometowns. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with hometown pride. It can create a sense of well-being and community, right? But it also has a dangerous side because it can lead to an us and them way of thinking. And that seems to be what's going on here. In a lot of stories in the Gospels, we see that Jesus has an incredible ability to zero in on the specific spiritual flaw that's limiting the people he talks to, and I think he does that now. After saying that no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown, he goes on to tell two quick stories that shine a spotlight on the us-them mentality that lurks behind the local pride of the people in Nazareth. First, he tells a story about the prophet Elijah from 800 years before, and he says, there were many widows in Israel during a time of drought and famine, but Elijah did not help any of these widows. Instead, he helped a widow in Lebanon. And second, he says that at the time of the prophet Elisha, there were many lepers in Israel, but Elisha cleansed none of them. Instead, he cleansed Naaman from Syria. And that's when his audience rises to their feet in anger, pushes Jesus out of town to the very edge of a cliff and intends to throw him off. Jesus has surprised his audience by poking their spiritual soft spot. He's making visible and directly challenging the us-them mentality hidden behind their local pride, and they respond with anger and violence. Surprises do not always bring out our best responses. But it's not just that they're surprised. There has to be something deeper going on to produce this kind of violence. What exactly makes them so mad? And it is not an easy question to answer. I confess I have struggled with this as I prepared for the talk today. But I suspect that Jesus is exposing a fear. Perhaps a fear they don't even know they have that they won't get the blessings that they deserve. That they will not get their fair share of the Holy Spirit's jubilee pie which reminds me of something that anthropologists call limited good. Limited good is a pretty straightforward concept. It's when we humans view good things as limited. These can be tangible good things, like food, fuel, and jobs, or they can be non-tangible things, like honor, knowledge, and love. I have two younger sisters, and when I was about 10, my grandmother, Esther Faye, brought a collective gift to the three of us. It was a set of nine little plastic animals, all different. Each of you can choose three, she said, and laid them out on a table. I immediately saw my three favorites and quickly snatched them up (laughs) before my younger sisters could select any of the ones that I wanted. My grandmother said nothing. She just watched while my sisters chose their animals. But later, 
She took me aside and offered some very direct thoughts <laughs> about selfishness. <laughs> Um, and I am sure that this moment stands out so strongly in my childhood memory because my grandmother did not typically criticize us. And so her words made a huge impact. This story is a moment of limited good. There were only three animals I cared about, and it was possible I was not going to get the ones that I wanted. Looking back, I wonder, I was 10, I wonder if I even wanted to play with these animals, right? But, the, you know, there was a situation of limited good, so out come my hand came and I grabbed them, right? There's something about limited good scenarios that bring out the worst in us. We can get kind of hangry about that last piece of pizza, can't we? <laughs> Ever been in that situation? Or Costco lines on the weekend? <laughs> what about that backed up right-hand turn lane in heavy traffic, right? You've been waiting for half an hour and suddenly somebody zips in the front. Limited good, right? And lest you think that, all, that limited good situations would not lead to violence today in our country, may I call your attention to that great American tradition of limited good that we call Black Friday. <laughs> you know what that is. <laughs> the retail practices on Black Friday create a pretty intense limited good situation. Sleep deprived people waiting in long lines to get deep discounts on the latest and greatest gadgets, but the supply is way out of line with the demand. Not everyone's gonna get what they want, only those who get there early or push their way to the front or grab it out of the hands of other shoppers, right? <laughs> and in fact, the limited good situation of Black Friday has led to some shockingly bad behavior. There was a terrible tragedy, you may remember, in 2013 when a security guard was trampled to death. Um, by crowds in New York and here in California two years earlier, a woman pepper sprayed a crowd. In order to get away with a discounted Xbox, although 20 people were injured, she was not charged with the crime because she said she sprayed the crowd in self-defense against shoppers gone wild who were attacking her children to take the Xbox away from them. So limited good thinking is powerful because it taps into something we know at a primal survival level. Our physical world has limited resources and often if someone else gets something, then I don't. And it can definitely bring out the worst in us and when it comes to hometown or regional or national or other kinds of group loyalties, limited good thinking, very easily morphs into a powerful us-them mentality. If God blesses them, there will be less blessing for us. If Elijah and Elisha go to them, that means the prophets did not come to us. Why would the Holy Spirit want to set them free when they are the ones threatening or opposing us? If they succeed, we will have less opportunity if they have more power we will have less influence if they take the jobs. We won't have them. If they increase, we will decrease. But Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, does not see the world this way. Jesus knows where the Holy Spirit will take this story. This jubilee will come to Jesus' hometown, but it won't stop there. It will move through Galilee and Judea to the south, Syria to the north, even farther south to Egypt, and finally even to the oppressors themselves, the Romans, and ultimately to the very ends of the earth. So Jesus is warning them and us of a danger. It is possible that hometown or regional or national or other kinds of our people pride can cause us to forget something essential about the Holy Spirit. The bounty of God's salvation is not just, or even primarily, for us. The triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit does not have an us and them limited good mentality when it comes to the blessings of salvation. Jesus reminds us that the Holy Spirit looks across the horizon to lands far away across cultural and ethnic divides the Holy Spirit does not see my side of town and your side of town, does not see ideologies or identities, does not see Americans or Syrians or Kenyans or Hondurans. God sees people, people, whole people, bodies, minds, and souls 
who hunger and thirst for food and water and righteousness, who need both physical and spiritual shelter and health, who are oppressed by sin, evil, and death, but also by human systems and practices, who need the refuge of God's wings, but also need the physical refuge of being welcomed as neighbors when they flee violence and terror. Jesus simply sees people in need of the Holy Spirit's jubilee, and so this text is great news. It is reason to celebrate and praise our great God for the many ways that the Holy Spirit is bringing us release. And it is also a deep challenge to our fears about limited good, our hesitancy about people who look or dress or think differently than we do, and our tendency in, to think in terms of us and them, boundaries, borders, and divisions. Which brings me back to pelicans, <laughs> in a way. The pelicans crashed a graduation that had at its speaker Father Gregory Boyle. If you don't know who he is, he is the founder of Homeboy Industries here in Los Angeles, which is the largest program in the world, providing intervention, rehabilitation, and re-entry programs for gang members. And it struck me as I listened to Greg Boyle that what he says corresponds so well with the Holy Spirit's jubilee in Luke 4. He speaks about the margins. And the margins are wherever we see boundaries between us and them. And he speaks about the people that he works with and he says they are the poor, the powerless, the voiceless, the easily despised, the readily left out and the demonized. They're folks whose dignity has been denied and whose burdens are more than they can bear. They are people on the margins and we are called to stand with folks on the margins. The idea is to create a community of kinship and dismantle the barriers that exclude. You erase the margins by standing in them, but we don't go to the margins to make a difference. We go to the margins so the folks at the margins will make us different. And this is the picture of the Holy Spirit's jubilee in Luke and Acts. The Holy Spirit breaks through our us and them human boundaries to create kinship. And we all sit down together at a meal with Jesus as our host, sharing our food and our cups of cold water so that no one has need. Because it's also a kind of captivity to live in fear and distrust of other human beings who are in fact created in the image of God. And the Holy Spirit wants to set us free from that prison too. Please pray with me. Lord God, you who are parent, child, and holy, empowering, life-giving, boundary-breaking, freedom-bringing spirit, set us free. Set us all free, we pray. Amen.